वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अपर्णा वाटवे फैकल्टी ऑफ टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल टॉक अबाउट कम्युनिटी मैनेजमेंट ऑफ कॉमन प्रॉपर्टी रिसोर्सेस दिस इज पार्ट ऑफ एनवायरमेंट एंड सोसाइटी पेपर इन द बिगिनिंग आई विल इंट्रोड्यूस एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ कम्युनिटी मैनेजमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशंस फॉर द कॉमन प्रॉपर्टी रिसोर्सेस we will take different examples from india from the past as well as from the present we will also talk about what new institutions have been created by the government for management of the common property resources we will talk about joint forest management and social forestry in the end we will try and understand how this has helped in the conservation india has a long history of conservation it has a history of management of traditional commons by communities some examples are sacred forest village forest one panchayats and grazing lands some of the traditional institutions have been rejuvenated in the new mechanisms by the government sacred groves are very old management practices these are forests which were believed to be sacred they were dedicated to the deity the village elders or knowledgeable people were in charge of maintaining the sacred groves sanctity in reality they were institutions of commons they were meant for common use and discourage private use private or individual use of resources in sacred groves was discouraged by inculcating fear of the god or goddess in many areas the trees or leaf litter could not be collected by a single person but for community purposes like building of school building of the temple the sacred grove forest could be used trees were allowed to cut only after taking a permission of the dt a road could be built through the sacred groves but even for that the permission of the dt was considered important if anybody used the resources for private use they were believed to be cursed by the dt but in many areas there were fines which were imposed on such individuals by the village itself Devara kadus in Karnataka are also sacred groves. They are seen in the Kodagu area of Karnataka. Some of the Devara kadus were on private lands. They belonged to a family or to a person. But the use was in common. They were used for the purpose of the village or for the community or for the clan. Generally temple in the sacred grove was a nucleus or center of religious activity of the village on some occasions like festivals people came together in sacred groves and they collected fuel wood in one of the sacred groves in konkan in maharashtra villagers decided one single day in the entire year on which they would go to the forest and collect leaf litter all together this ensured that there was no indiscriminate extraction of leaf litter throughout the year this helped in sustainable management of the sacred grove resources in the past the fear of the deity was very strong in addition to that the fines were pretty heavy on individuals and therefore nobody wanted to break the rules in some sacred groves in meghalaya people were not allowed to enter wearing footwear some of these rules may appear strange to us today but the result of these rules was that people obeyed them they feared the village as well as the deity and this led to sustainable use of the scarce resources another example of community management areas is one panchayat forest in uttarakhand the one panchayats or village forest councils 
were established long ago. This is a unique community managed forest institution in India. In the 1890s, colonial government forcibly took control over all non-private land and forest of the United Provinces, an area which is today Uttarakhand. Loss of access to forest actually hurt people because they were dependent on it for their livelihoods. There were widespread protests from the people. Women took a strong role in this because they were affected the most by loss of fuel wood and fodder. The British government in 1931 issued first Kumau Panchayat Forest Rules. This enabled the mountain communities to gain control over their village forest and also to manage it as they required. The Central Forest Department retained control over timber and raisin management. But the villagers received a share of the profits made by sale of these products. In addition, they were allowed to use forest resources according to the rules that were framed by the village itself. Today in Uttarakhand, there are more than 12,000 one panchayats. They are governed by forest panchayat rules. There is today competition among villages for the forest products. Some amount of encroachment and illegal failing is still seen. The most successful one panchayats have actually employed guards and rotate the responsibility of patrolling and protection among the households. The smaller one panchayats cannot afford such guards. They have to patrol themselves. There have been periodic changes in the rules from 1971 to 2005. Many of the rules made by the state reduced the authority of the Vana Panchayats. There are other similar institutions in other parts of India. Gramya jungles are village forest institutions in Odisha. Village forests in this case are managed again for community purposes by the community. So far, we looked at community management of forest habitats. Now, we will take a look at community management of grazing lands. Grazing lands were community commons in most parts of India. They were necessary as many people kept livestock and depended on cattle, sheep and goat. In Himachal Pradesh, Shamlats were common grazing lands managed by panchayats until 1974. Punjab Village Common Lands Regulation Act of 1961 allowed this. These were non-exclusive property of the village community and could not be privatized by a single individual. In the 1970s, central government passed the Himachal Pradesh Village Common Land Wasting and Utilization Act. This act transferred the common lands ownership from panchayats to the state government. Except where lands were subjected to partition between individual co-sharers before the date of commencement of this act. This resulted in increased partitioning of the land. Common lands were used by farmers for individual benefits. Many encroachments were legalized by political leaders in the 1980s. Privatized pastures were converted into cultivation. This forced the livestock herders to graze on more and more degraded areas and often in the forest. Instead of common grazing lands, they had to rely on other habitats and led to degradation of the forests. In Maharashtra, common grazing lands in many areas were taken away by the forest department. In the Deccan Peninsula region, sanctuaries were created by taking away common grazing lands. This was for the protection of grasslands, but it had a very negative effect on the livestock herders of the region. There was a shift in grazing areas. In many cases, the community could not manage grazing on other areas 
and they had forced into wildlife sanctuaries. There were regular conflicts and these continue even today. The water sources were also now part of the sanctuary. These were essential in the semi-arid areas. Those who could not afford to conflict with the forest department had to move to other areas. They took up nomadic pastoralism. They moved to other areas and even had conflicts in those. They moved to other areas but even had to conflict with the settled communities from the other areas. In some cases, they gave up livestock herding altogether because it was no more profitable. Government then had to start participatory management of commons. It had realized that it is necessary to involve people in the management. One of the programs which has been there for a long time is of joint forest management. This started in the 1980s. This is a program launched by the government of India. It is meant for the protection of forest and forest lands with the participation of the local communities. In the past, government had excluded local people from conservation. But this was seen as bad step. Very soon it was realized that local people need to support the conservation. The 1988 National Forest Policy was a major step in this. In this policy, it was accepted that the forest and forest lands need to provide for the needs of the people. They have to, be, they have to provide fuel wood and fodder which is requirement of most rural areas. This led to the formation of Joint Forest Management Guidelines sometime around 1990s. This was the first time such a step was taken. It led to other guidelines which made the program stronger. Some of the main features of JFM are that community is central to forest protection and management. State Forest Department supports local communities to protect and manage the forest. They also share the costs and benefits that arise from the forest. Joint Forest Management Committee is formed by involving local people and a representative from the forest department. It is expected that women and marginal communities are part of this Joint Forest Management Committee. This is because they have the most stake in the conservation of forest. In the protected areas, there is another effort known as Eco-Development Committee. This has the same mandate as the Joint Forest Management, but it is mainly seen in and around the forests which are protected. Impacts of JFM have been studied in many areas. Communities led by the forest officials have power to manage the use of forests by members and to exclude the non-members. There is a secured claim and benefits that arise from the protection of the forest. This improves the position of the users. Their position in the village is improved socially as well as culturally and economically. There is funding sometimes for local users from the government to manage the forest. In this effort, livelihood is also linked. In many areas, women created plant nurseries as a part of JFM program, large-scale plantation watershed management efforts were undertaken. In recent times, joint forest management committees have also started ecotourism initiatives in the forest areas nearby. However, it is not always a positive impact. There are many areas where some kinds of negative impacts have been known. In some cases, JFM regularizes earlier de facto rules, which could have been inequitable allocation of the resources. Many places, JFM committees are dominated by men from the upper class and upper caste. Although women 
and marginal communities are represented, they are for the namesake. They do not have the actual decision making power in JFM committee. This has led to loss of many users. JFM funds are often mismanaged, misused, where the committee is not well formed. There are some very good examples from the early efforts of joint forest management. One of the first ones was in West Bengal. This was a successful exercise, mainly because there were short term alternatives for income and a long term share in the timber. In the West Bengal, village protection committees took control of mixed sal forest as a part of JFM initiative. They gave preferential access to minor forest products. One fourth share of income from the sal stem and timber was going to the village. The responsibility of protection and of harvesting sustainably was with the village forest committee. They took greater share of the revenue. In many areas, JFM committees have encountered problems because the two villages whose boundaries are overlapping do not agree to resource use. There are very few production options in non-sal forest. There is therefore a need for careful micro planning if joint forest management has to be economically viable and ecologically sustainable. It is very important that this is done in collaboration with scientists, researchers, communities, forest department and non-governmental organizations which are working for the people. In summary, we can say that joint forest management was having good success but it was limited. Many of the Panchayati Raj institutions limited the capacity to manage and develop common lands. Some of the newly formed institutions conflicted with the earlier traditional community institutions. These experiences have helped us to lead to new examples by sharing the experiences. There is today a definite change in the working of the forest department. They are more open to participatory management. Other kinds of common lands are social forestry woodlots. In 1976, the National Commission of Agriculture recommended growing trees on lands accessible to villagers. This was to increase production of forest produce and to strengthen local collective managements. Common woodlots were developed under social forestry programs. These woodlots were supposed to be created on uncultivated government lands or village common lands. But sometimes these lands were not available. In such cases, plantations were forcibly taken up in good habitats, sometimes by cutting sacred groves or even parts of forest. This was a misinterpretation of the entire concept. Advocacy for land grants started around 1990s. Social activists demanded redistribution of common lands. They wanted agricultural land for the landless people. But in the end, many times the landless people were given lands which were common lands which had been degraded already. In the end, social forestry lands were very small. They could not meet the demands of the local villagers. Sometimes social forestry was seen merely as an income generating activity. Rather than looking at the results, one looked only as short term gains. There were benefits to the local people by wage employment, but it did not ultimately lead to conservation of good forest. In some cases, forest department did not want to hand over the control of these forest lots to the villagers. There was a lack of communication between all. Finally, these ended up neglected by everyone and were degraded. 
Today, focus has shifted from development of common lands to development of lands outside of commons. Another scheme of Indian government has actually helped in management of common resources. Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme or MGNREGS is a scheme known as right to work. This gives livelihood security to rural areas. Every year, 100 days of wage employment is to be given to every household for unskilled manual work. The activities which can be taken up under this scheme are all for improving common property resources. They include activities for recharging groundwater, preventing natural hazards, and creating forest areas. There are many benefits to the livelihoods of the poor. It provides short-term employment to rural communities. At the same time, it contributes towards sustainability of natural resources in the region. One interesting example of community-led initiative is from a tribal village, Baripada, in North Maharashtra. In Baripada, in 1991, the conditions of the people were very sad. The resources had depleted. There was migration to other areas just for survival. In this, one of the local youths became a leader. He formed a forest protection committee called as Vanasaroksha Samiti. They helped to conserve the surrounding 445 hectares of forest. They tried to regenerate the forest cover and help the water table around the village. The committee created rules to regulate the use of forest products. People together built bunds to stop soil erosion. They planted mahua and mango saplings all over the area. As the forest regenerated, the groundwater table improved dramatically. This helped in agriculture. The community was mobilized to work together to create sustainable way of life. They reinvented the traditional agroforestry systems. There are some common factors that help in the management of common property resources by community. When the community needs scarce natural resources, they will be mobilized to work for them. If there is increased pressure from outside agencies, communities try and protect their own resources. Dynamic leadership and help from voluntary organization is also useful. In the end, there need to be legal provisions that support the community initiatives. There has to be enabling environment in all the government agencies, otherwise it will hamper the efforts by the community. What we have learned from these examples of how common property resource management can be done by communities in future. There is a need of information system that tells us about common land and water resources, what is their status today and what needs to be improved scientifically. Common lands are approximately one-fifth of India. If managed well, they have the potential to support ecosystems as well as provide for rural livelihoods. Significantly, and equitably. In this module, we looked at various efforts of community property management. We looked at traditional institutions and we also looked at new people's institutions. We also looked at some of the government schemes which have helped in management of common property resources. In the end, we understood the factors which help in management by the people. I hope you have enjoyed this session. You can read the e-text which accompanies this module. You can also take a look at books, film links and papers which are given in the essential reading. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.